I want to also introduce my colleagues. So we have Claire Balsley, who's our Director of Disaster Assistance Programs. She's going to be speaking to us um, after my session this morning, later this morning, about um, the importance of the FEMA appeals process. And then I have Joe Boys here who, what's your title there, Joe? Director of Government Partnerships. <laughs> Director of Government Partnerships. So he works on our advise team, um, really supporting a lot of our like uh, local, state, and federal advisory work that we do. And so he's going to be speaking after lunch this afternoon um, about our long-term recovery group training. So thank you both. You can head back. <laughs> Um, I'm Angela, so I'm uh, SBP's manager of NGO partnerships. I run our in-house foundation. We call it our SHARE program. I'm not really going to talk about that program much today. Um, I'm going to wear my other hat, which is our training um, kind of module. So what I'll go over today is a bit of SBP's history. I've, I've been with uh, SBP since Hurricane Sandy back in New York. I'm from New York, um, and I got started in disasters because Sandy hit my backyard and it mattered to me. And so I got into this work with having no disaster experience before then, which I think what I've seen is that's pretty typical of a lot of people in recovery. Um, and so I, I learned a lot of this myself and I'm really passionate about hopefully sharing it with some other folks that maybe don't have to learn the things I personally learned the hard way, um, but then also the collaborative information SVP has learned over two decades with communities. Um, so I'll do a little, a brief um, sort of module on the Toyota production system, which is maybe what differentiates us from some other rebuild groups. And then I'll go into our Recovery 101. The Recovery 101, I think is, that's like, that's like my, my baby, my piece. I feel really passionate about it. We're going to talk about contractor fraud, how to like walk survivors and homeowners through avoiding contractor fraud, muck and gut and mold suppression, when, and then touch a little bit on insurance, but um, we're not going to get too into insurance. We have the expert on insurance in the room, and if you have questions, I would direct you to, to Valerie. Um, okay, so with that, I'll get started. Oh, that's fine. Um, so like I said, it's a small group of us. Bill, am I good here? This area is fine? Cool. Um, so SBP, St. Bernard Project, um, we actually got started, like Marcia said, down in St. Bernard Parish after uh, Hurricane Katrina. What you may remember from Katrina, those flyover videos of the houses with the water right up to the roof line, that's the St. Bernard Parish. Um, and so we got started there versus Orleans Parish because you know you might remember Orleans Parish had a lot of attention. Jefferson Parish, um, Lafouche, Terrebonne, all these parishes that got a lot of attention meant they got more money and more volunteers versus St. Bernard which was predominantly a lower income, like black and brown community that really wasn't getting much attention. So we started there, um, just direct service providers. Our founders, their names are Zach and Liz. They went down thinking, kind of like I did, oh, volunteer for a while. Let's see how we can you know, plug in and help. And 20 years later, they're still doing it. Um, what made them a bit different was super early on, and I'm obviously going to get into this, we partnered with Toyota, um, and Toyota was able to share us on their production system. So literally how they make a ball of steel into a Camry every hour, that's like the process that we use for our clients and construction. So that, I think, early on helped differentiate how we were rebuilding, how we were thinking about it. Um, and so then in 2011, the Joplin EF5 tornado went through there, and I, I got to go to Joplin a few times, and it was terrifying. Um, and that was the space where we said, hey, there's amazing community leaders out here, but we have this model that really has worked for us in New Orleans, let's share it. And so we partnered with a group called Rebuild Joplin out there and, and used the TPS system. And then again in Sandy in New York and New Jersey, where I came in, um, and then after Houston, in Houston after Harvey, the Carolinas after Florence and Matthew and Joaquin, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, I mean, like the list just keeps going, unfortunately. Um, and we, we have continued to do it. We still are doing direct service in communities across the country and the Bahamas. Um, but what we've really realized is the importance of sharing what we've learned versus actually rebuilding. I, probably, I think that everybody in the room might agree we can't, as the nonprofit sector, individually rebuild every house every time, even collaboratively, it's, it's almost impossible. So how do we share knowledge, right, across? And so, so the SHARE program, which is up here um, and listed, 
that's where we like encompass and package all of those lessons learned. Um, so that's a bit of a history on SVP. And like I said, it's a small group, so if you have questions, like please just jump in. Um, I'm pretty informal, so feel, <laughs> feel comfortable. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of center us around like why we do this, right? I mean, I know I don't have to tell you guys because you're all also out there doing it, um, but this is a woman, her name's, uh, well, in the upper left, her name's Audrey Hawkins. I've got to spend a lot of time with her. So her great-grandmother's home was perfectly fine during Katrina. She's a Louisiana native. Um, but then Ida, in 2021, went through and was a, w a wind event, not a flood event, which is different, and we'll get into it. But ripped off the roof of their 240-year-old home that was given to them um, after, basically, emancipation. Um, and so then they've had this home for generations, and it was just destroyed. Um, and we met a group called Louisiana Just Recovery Network. There was a social services group. They're an environmental sustainability group, believe it or not, and they do amazing work around the Gulf. And they were like, we gotta raise our hand, we gotta figure out how to help these people. So they partnered with us. Um, we gave them a bunch of training, a few gr smaller grants, and they were able to rebuild for Audrey. So that's, um, she's doing some of the, it's called Barge Board. It's this pretty cool wood, you can see it on the left above the, that is a three-sided fireplace. Um, and the barge board is wood they took from barges that were coming in off the Mississippi back in the 1800s. And she was able to preserve it, so she's preserving it there and then re, um, reinstalling it into the house. So just a, a story to, I think, remember why we do this and why it matters um, that we're being as efficient and predictable for the survivors as possible because you know, it's obviously traumatizing to go through an event, but it's, it can be even like secondarily traumatizing to have no predictability and no path. So just important that, that we keep that in mind as we, as we go through this today. So I mean, I, I touched on it a bit, but we exist for a myriad of reasons. The three main that I wanted to focus on are economic mobility. We know that disasters, um, in differently affect different populations. Um, and so it's really important that we're remembering some communities and some populations can more easily recover than others. And that we're all like really honing in on those uh, vulnerable, most vulnerable populations. Women, single moms, women and children, elderly, anyone living alone. Um, those are really the folks that we wanna be supporting through our, our efforts. And Cla yeah, please, Is this yes. Slide that gonna be shared with us? Yeah, it, it can be. Yeah, I think it's all being recorded, and so we're gonna we can send the recording out to everybody who signed up. But we can send the slide deck. Yeah. This saves a lot of writing of. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, a hundred percent. My God, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, no, that's a good. I'm glad you mentioned. Uh, maybe I'll make a note for later sessions too, so people know they don't have to ask. But yeah, thank you. What was your name, Cole? Yeah. Cole, nice to meet you, Cole. Um, so yeah, so that is our big first piece and climate adaptation. Extreme weather events are happening more and more. I don't have to say that to you. We're here in California. Um, and then economic and racial equity. There's so much generational wealth and equity, obviously tied into home ownership. And if you're already kind of living paycheck to paycheck and not, I mean, barely making it at work, and then a disaster hits and you don't have the, the path to repair your home, you're either gonna live in a home that's unsanitary and you shouldn't be living in maybe, or B, you leave that home and you know who knows where you're gonna go to next. Hopefully you have relatives that you can move in with, but that's not always the case for everybody. Um, and frequently is not the case. So we just really wanna tie in a lot of this work to remembering home ownership is like the biggest asset for folks that are vulnerable to begin with, and this will help uh, create stability in the, in the long term. So like I mentioned, we have, SVP has grown. We are continually are evolving. Right now we have five, we call them interventions, ways that we kind of uh, interact with the wider community. So we still have our build program. We um, are doing, we do a lot of preparedness in person and virtual trainings. Um, and our SHARE program, that's my, that's my um, program, is where we have grants, training opportunities, and AmeriCorps placement. Uh, support. So if there's a local NGO that maybe could benefit from some extra capacity, 
We have such a large AmeriCorps cohort that we're able to do a cost share program, assuming they're eligible, um, for an AmeriCorps member. I was an AmeriCorps member 10 years ago, so I'm a big fan, but, um, but I'm really proud of that program. I think it's really helpful for small groups. Um, and then our advise and advocate programs are where, I mean, we, we, I don't think we would be splitting hairs to say this, but the system generally does not work for survivors. It especially doesn't work for vulnerable survivors, but it's a bit of a broken system across the board. So with this work, um, my colleague Joe, who is going to be speaking later, we do a lot of uh, local, state, and county, um, federal legislation and advocacy. And this is just sort of a map of all the locations that we've, this doesn't mean we're currently in all these places, but we have been over the years. Okay, so now the actual presentation. So before I get into that, really quick, any questions? Any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit about the Toyota production system. The Toyota production system, like I said, it's taking this vehicle assembly line and literally transposing it into the construction and client process. Mm -hmm. The whole point of the Toyota production system is to be really outcomes and um, yeah, outcomes and goal focused versus putting a lot of money, a lot of volunteers, a lot of manpower into a machine and then hoping it's going to spit out a lot of productivity. That sometimes can work and it's fantastic when it does. But how do you sort of prepare for that and then like measure it along the way, know if you're ahead or behind, and then know like where you land? This is really brief today. Um, there's a few reasons why it's brief, but um, I'll get into it in a second. But I want to make sure that you have like the general concept of Toyota production system. If you're interested in learning more, there's books. Like I can talk to you after about a whole bunch of different ways that you could learn more. But this is going to be like a brief overview. So some of the goals, you're going to hear me refer a lot to our build program. So like I said, we're still a direct service provider, still out there doing it, that we call that our build program. Um, and so this is mostly wrapped in that, like all of our direct service work. It is, I mean, I have goals and KPIs, every program does, but I'm going to use the build program as the example because I think that's going to be most relevant. Um, but it can, it can be applied to any, any sort of work. And we're going to go through the principles um, and how to apply it. And then also, you maybe took a packet when you walked in. If you didn't, they're just on the table. But the first page, yeah, it's the first page um, of the packet is going to have like a little, it's a worksheet on how to apply some of these principles to your own programs. And so you could use whatever example is in your head, like just knocking around in there and, um, and kind of go through it as we, as we go through. So how it all works. Okay, so there's three really like main tiers to how our build program works. One, manpower, that could be volunteers, subcontractors, um, staff, we, AmeriCorps members, it's all kind of just in that manpower bucket. Dollars, that's gonna be your um, philanthropy funds that you get, could be state money that you know comes out through grants, could be from volunteers that are donating or in-kind uh, materials that you get. So any sort of um, financial support. And then AmeriCorps. So we have, like I mentioned, a very large cohort of AmeriCorps, um, and they really help us have consistency with our manpower. And so those are kind of the three main pieces. Question for you. Yes. In the manpower piece, do you include a, a piece around the clients you're serving? So they have a one-stop place to go for all the different kinds of services? Yes, and that is a uh, future slide, so Great. excellent question. <laughs> but yes, we are very much a one-stop shop for clients. And then by having a volunteer client and construction department, you're kind of su supporting all three of those pieces within like the one client services. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll get into that, but it's a good question. Okay, so we, just to be transparent, we were not always this efficient. You'll see on the next chart, our trajectory of productivity. Um, and so this is a really, I think it's a cool picture. We can see the before and then sort of the after of the work that we've done, but it's taken a long time to get there. Okay, so here, um, say that again? We've been working since uh, 19 years, I think we've been doing this. 
Oh no, that house. Um, typically, it's about 116. It was 116 days per home to rebuild it, and after Toyota, we brought it down to 61. Um, and so you'll you'll see that though. But yeah, thank you for helping me clarify that. We've been we were working without Toyota for maybe a, you know seven or eight years, and then brought in Toyota's production system, and it changed the amount of time it took to rebuild a house. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that, yeah. And I think this slide might help answer that a little bit. So you can see here, like the early days before 2011, which is when we met with Toyota, there's a lot of money coming in, it's only increasing, the amount of homes for the most part is increasing. Um, but then in 2011, we had $3 million more, so many more volunteers, and yet less homes. And once we came in with Toyota and their production system, you'll see there's a change in that. But just remember this slide when we start going through it. Is the number of houses, that, is that the number served, or is that the total number that were impacted by the disaster? It's total number of homes complete. So it's homes that we repaired or rebuilt. So it'd be interesting to see that versus the total number of homes in the disaster, which might be 10 or 100 times that. Oh, it's, it's tremendously more than that. Yeah, I mean, this was also back in 2011. This is before Joplin even. So these numbers are specific to just New Orleans. So if, if you're remembering what I was mentioning about us gro our growth, this is all pre any other operating site. This is strictly New Orleans. So, but yeah, I mean, Cole, to your point, if you overlaid this with number of families, obviously, that I mean, there's thousands of people there that we couldn't meet. Yeah, I've got a friend that lives right there, so. Yeah. Still going through it. Yeah, I mean, uh, from Ida in New Orleans, or from. From Katrina, yeah, I believe it. I mean, the lower ninth ward still looks like oh, yeah. it just happened. Yeah, well, and I've got a friend in New York also that got hit just like you and became involved just like you. After Sandy, yeah, 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 it, it, yeah. He's out here now. <laughs> like yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, it, it's different things everywhere, but it's something. Okay, so and as I, I was kind of mentioning this earlier, but in 2011 when we partnered with Toyota. What you'll see is this result of, instead of it taking 116 days, which, to give you some more context, was like a, what do they call it? It's a shotgun, two-bedroom house. Everything is pretty standard. They're like double homes, uh, attached homes next to each other. And so it was taking about 116 days to do those homes. After we in included the production system, it was only taking 61 days. Same amount of dollars. It was the um, same amount of volunteers and I'm able to do the homes a lot faster. So even if initially we weren't doing that many more homes, the, at least the amount of time it took was a lot shorter. Um, and we'll get into why in a second. Okay, so now here's the video. Bill, let's see. I think it's going to work. I have all the faith in the world that it's going to work. Soon after we opened up, we thought, 
with more staff and more volunteers and more AmeriCorps members and money, we would be able to see more families come home. And the exact opposite was happening. The results were getting worse. We knew we needed to work smarter. We just didn't know how. To do that, we had to change, and we were really fortunate to have met Toyota at that point. Over the last 70 years, Toyota's been developing how to create the best production system possible. If we do something well, we want to share. We want to give it back to the community. The whole thinking behind the Toyota production system is continuous improvement. How do we improve the process? We want to get everybody back home. In Toyota, if the shop floor line stops, there's a problem. You can see it very quickly. In this kind of setting across the whole city of New Orleans, it's not so simple to see. Before Toyota came in, we had a lot of information about our different clients' homes, but a lot of it was sort of tucked away and hidden in computers. When you have a whiteboard system that's set up, it's easy for anybody to use, it's easy for anybody to read and track all the different projects and whether they're ahead or behind. We were the good guys, right? We were successful. We had built more houses than anyone else. We didn't talk about problems. By eliminating problems, we're getting incrementally better. We fix little things all day long, and the collective of all those little things helps overall performance significantly. People said there weren't enough ladders. We named all of our ladders, so that way we know, all right, we do have two extension ladders. We don't have to go buy another two. Some of them we give, like, human names, like Morty, Tuesday. Emily. Mr. Steppelon. Ladder source Rex. <laughs> taking us 116 days to build houses before Toyota and after it was 61 days. We reduced construction time almost by half. So, you know, that's a, that's a big difference. Once you're liberated and you can actually talk about what's not working and there's a tried and true process to fixing it, then you can really think big. So you look at Toyota's team. If you do it well, share it. We've worked in four different states, training other organizations. We can change disaster recovery in America. Um, yep, we've provided some much more detailed muck and gut and mold training to Team Rubicon in Houston. We did a bunch of training with them. Um, they're like debris removal, like gut guys and gals, um, but we we provided a lot of the like mold piece of it to them. Um, they also rebuild houses. They do, yeah. Um, is there a question? Yes. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, and not in New Orleans. I think it was out of state, but I'm not sure. Yeah. But yes, I've no, heard I, that. Their national guys shared that, and that was just really cool that you were funding them if they decided to get into rebuilding. Yep. Um, they, they've been great partners. I mean, we've worked with them in New York after Sandy for a while when they were volunteering, and now it's awesome to see like the relationship how it's grown. So, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, here's a, a question. Does anybody know how Toyota got started? Open to the group. Just shout it out. Want to guess? Any guess? Cole, you had a lot. No, no. I'm guessing a scooter or something like that. <laughs> not far. Not far. Oh, don't guess. Yeah, don't yeah. Uh, um, No. So actually, so Sakichi. I gotta get make, get this name right. Sakichi Toyota watched his mother work in a textile factory. 
um, for years and years and realized she was putting so much effort in and getting not a lot out. Um, and so he actually invented the first uh, automatic loom. So he started as a loom production. Um, and then two generations later, his, I think, grandson, uh, Kiichi Toyota, Toyota um, actually put it into the motorized car and, and automobiles system. So it started with a loom. So I think that's really interesting. I always like to share it. Um, and we, like the video said, that video is actually from um, 2015. So it's a pretty old video. It says that we rebuilt 600 homes. I think last time I checked, it was like last month, we're at about 5,200 homes across the US. And then granted, that is based like with other operating sites now. It's not just New Orleans. Um, that includes New York and Jersey everywhere. So just some context there. But yeah, so we, we were able to partner with them really early. Um, and what they brought to the table was this idea and like ethos of what's called um, socio-technical responsibility, which is a really like high functioning uh, people and process as your main um, focus areas. So if you're keeping in mind your people as your biggest asset and the process that's gonna support them to be as efficient and effective as possible, um, then you're able to really apply this system to anywhere. So the other piece I wanna say is, I know this is, it's all very, it's all very SBP, it's all very build specific. Um, this is how we've adapted it to our build program. But like I said earlier, this can be adapted to any sort of program. It's not at all like rebuild specific or SBP specific. So this is the example, of course, that I'm gonna go through, but think when, I mean, and the worksheet hopefully helps you with that, but uh, you can apply it to your own programs very easily. Uh, yep. So would you ever, I had no idea you guys did all these great builds. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, would you ever, and I know we're probably the most challenging state in the union to build in, and I'm like, wow, it would be great if we actually functioned like that. Would you ever consider taking on California, getting a contract with license to work under and supporting our rebuild? We have so few, so many homes to rebuild and only two partners that are able yeah, um, we have gotten asked that question before. I mean, it takes a lot of capital to be able to set up an off, like a real brick and mortar in a state. I don't think we'd, I'm sure we'd be open to it, but the capital, I mean, even like for example, Florida was a tremendous disaster with Ian. Um, and we did get in some really good funding, but even that like wasn't really enough for a second brick and mortar. We have one in Panama City in Florida after Michael. Um, but it wasn't even enough for another separate office down in Southwest Florida. So it, I think we'd be open to it, but it just, it, it does take a lot. And I will also say that if you're interested, and this is the later slide, but I can jump around a little, there's only a few of us. Um, Toyota still provides this consulting for free to nonprofits. They do charge um, corporate groups, and I'm not sure what they're, how they support government. If they do at all, I'm not really sure. But I know for the nonprofit sector, they, they can come in and provide it for free to the nonprofits. There's some caveats to that that I'll get into in a minute, but they still do that. We worked with a group in Kentucky a few weeks ago that was interested. Um, so if you are really interested in learning more, like I said, this is brief, um, see me at the end and I can, I can introduce you to some of the Toyota folks. But they're really great. They've been doing it forever. Scott Porter, who's in that video, came to New York for days and like, made us go through the whole process again and again and again. So they're, they're really great. Um, and they're, they're wonderful to work with. So I'll keep going on because I don't want to get too behind. So how long yeah. is the training? Oh, it's long. Uh, so it's not even, I don't think they even call it a training. They have a first meeting where they come in and meet with your senior leadership, board, everybody. So Because it's really a culture shift. It's not just a process. It's like your whole board has to be bought into this and senior leadership, otherwise it's not gonna happen. Um, and so they'll wanna meet with them first for X amount of hours. Um, and then after that, then they'll come in and they call it being on the shop floor and meeting with everybody who's like actually doing the work. And they mean everybody. I mean like executive assistants, construction folks, everybody. Um, because it, it's gonna be, a, like a, again, a culture. Um, and so it's important that everybody's bought into it. So there's not really like a number of hours I can give you, um, but that's kind of how they structure it, if that helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that a question? Sure. Yeah, not necessarily a question, but 
TensorFlow manufacturing is what Toyota did, and I'm in mm -hmm. manufacturing, and we used it, and I wrote the program for Flextronics and cool. UCLA. Cool. Okay. And they just met the methodology they used. True, it worked very well compared to how things are put together. And as you said, the reduced training, but it also reduces rework, and it reduces yes. a few other things, not to get into the jargon. But the point is, is that that really did work quite well. My big concern was always supply chain. Yeah, you show all the houses after 61 days, but I said, how long did it take you to get the wood? How long did mm. it get you to get nails? Yeah. How long did it actually get all the tar paper? Right. And that's the question you always run into. And we just finished doing that with China, if you remember, in 2000, 2020. Yeah, so I, remember I think that. it's a great thing, but I'm really curious about the actual process. In other words, you know, what's your infrastructure, what's your foundation? Yeah. To move something like that forward because there's an awful lot of variables that have to be. As far as mm -hmm. the methodology, yeah, I got it, I understand it, and you do, you train your people for that. But I'm just wondering as far as what kind of, you know, what kind of checkpoints and what kind of hiccups did you have along the way trying to get all those, all that product to your, to your job site? Yeah, I mean, and I was in New York, and so I got the benefit of them having already fine-tuned it in New Orleans and then bringing it to New York. But I will say um, my counterpart in Puerto Rico and uh, my other counterpart in the Bahamas, when they were first starting up, they had to figure out similar issues with the supply chain. How do we get everything to you know, islands and in a reliable, consistent amount of time so that we can keep up with productivity uh, or production, really? But I, and I, so I can't speak specifically to it because I haven't had that experience, but I know there was, a, there was a lot of bulk ordering as much as possible and based on the goals and the amount of time that they believed they needed per house, they could back into that to figure out, per month we think we're gonna start, say, three houses. So that means if we think over the next six months we're gonna do you know, 18 houses, then what does that mean for materials and like pre-ordering a lot of that? So I, I don't like specifically know, and also you probably could be up here giving this presentation with me since you have a lot of experience, but, um, there, there was a lot of like pre-bulk ordering with the, the, the islands that, and, and where we were doing work. And since we live in California, that even makes it more difficult. Oh, I'm sure, and I know COVID so made it impossible. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know, chemicals and all the other stuff that go behind that as well. Yeah, there's not, I mean, there's not a simple like answer, I guess, but I think you, with the idea of surfacing problems, talking about it, not like kind of shaming anybody who has an issue, that does help like facilitate some productive conversations. Yeah, mine is yeah. more like the process. So yeah. Know, how did you get there? What's your methodology and how did you get around to it? Well, let's, I'll keep going. I think maybe, maybe it will help. I don't know if it'll answer everything, but we'll keep going here. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so, and like I meant, the questions are great. They're skipping around a little bit with the slides, so just forgive me for that. Um, but yeah, it's really critical that we have board buy-in. As I mentioned, it's, it's a culture shift, not just a process. Um, and then that even means your executive directors, deputies, the folks that are going to be managing the shop floor, they're all bought into it and understand the value of it. Um, and that could be X amount of hours or days in order to get to that point. So there's some basic principles. Um, you kind of mentioned some, I didn't catch your name, but you, ca you caught, caught a few of them. So the idea of continuous improvement was mentioned in the video. That, um, the Japanese word for that is Kaizen, and so we, we say Kaizen. So that means, from myself as an AmeriCorps member 11 years ago, I remember being out on site and not being able to get my supplies fast enough from our supply and logistics folks. And I knew, like, I was empowered enough to go and talk to my project manager. It's all through this very, like, respectful problem-solving lens. So if you're going to bring a problem, you're supposed to bring a solution that you think you could recommend. It might not work, but you at least try and have a solution. Um, to your supervisor, and then everybody works together. There's like a series of five whys that you go through to get to sort of the core of it. Um, but it's this idea that anybody around can surface a problem. And then if and when there is a problem that has to stop productivity, there's this idea of pulling an and on. And so like, you know, from manufacturing, production lines, especially with vehicles, they pull, I think a physical thing, um, and it stops the production, the, the, the car, you know, obviously moving through the line. So this way everybody comes in and focuses on the issue before passing the problem along to the next person to the next person. And if you're thinking about that in terms of like client support, if a client um, is working with a caseworker and you know the caseworker notices 
oh, they kind of went through the scope and estimate really quickly when we did, we call it a start file, it could be a kickoff meeting, whatever, they went through it quickly. I don't know that they really were paying attention and then they just hand it off, they sign the document, good luck construction team. Um, then the construction team has a problem. Whereas if the, client, the caseworker had gone back and talked to the client again or talked to the construction folks and said, this is an issue that we're gonna have and getting ahead of it, you're preventing passing that problem on to the next department. I mean, and maybe that example is relevant, maybe not, but I definitely experienced that. So um, just thinking about how we can solve it in real time versus passing it along. And then the idea of reducing MUDA, so MUDA's waste. Waste can be a bunch of things, overproduction, time, materials, people. If you have a construction team of four folks that you're paying a whole bunch of money to have all these construction team members and they're only producing three houses a month and it's maybe only repairs, do you really need four construction people or what's really going on there that you're only able to produce three houses a month? So thinking about overproduction also as an, a form of waste. Um, and then visualization. We're gonna get into some slides with that, but visualization uh, helps you measure this idea of a header behind. And we do that with like whiteboards the size of this whole wall. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, and like I mentioned too, so it's this idea of being outcomes based. And we do that by defining success. We're gonna rebuild 100 houses this year, whatever. Um, then you're going to set goals. So that means you need to do X amount of homes per month. If you need to do X amount of homes per month, then how many homes do you have to actually get applications in for? Say you're going to start five houses a month. You know, we know not every application you get is going to be approved or the client's not going to go through with it. So maybe actually you need like eight applications a month. So, okay, if I need eight applications per month, when I'm doing my outreach, how many people do I have to hit with my outreach? 15,000, cool, I gotta hit 15,000 people. And then you work yourself back into your 100 uh, homes per, per year goal. So it's a lot of that sort of like numeric outcomes based thinking um, with goals and then KPIs just means key performance indicators. A, a key performance indicator would be, like I said, you need eight applications per month to be able to start five homes per month. That's a key performance indicator. I mean, I have it for my like foundation program, they're totally different, but similar idea. Um, okay, and so I also mentioned this idea of having a lot coming into a funnel and maybe not as much coming out of it, right? So this idea of rebuilding fast, taking in as much money as you can get on the front end, which is of course important, getting as much and many volunteers signed up as possible, um, but then tracking that and making sure you're using it consistently and not just trying to pump out as much as you can. Let's see, so I'm taking a picture. I'll pause for a second. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm a little behind on time, so I'm going to keep going through this a um, bit faster. So again, if the goal here is 100, like I mentioned, receiving applications, assigning those scopes and estimates, which then goes down to start files, 110 start files. Even when you're at the kickoff meeting or the start file, maybe 10 of those won't work out. Maybe somebody you've worked with <laughs> for six months decides, uh -huh, this isn't for me. We've kind of all been there maybe, or maybe it's just me, I don't know. Um, but you wanna build in extra for that, right? So it's important when you're doing all your tracking that you're thinking about that. Um, and I worked with a whole bunch of New York City clients for eight years and any scenario that has happened, I've probably experienced some, por some version of that. So. I give these examples as things I've actually been through. <laughs> um, and even breaking it down per week and per associate. Like if you have, or if you have case managers, you have six case managers, how many applications do each of those people need to get in? Which then makes it really easy to track if those are good case managers or unproductive case managers, because you know everybody's gotta be doing eight per week. This one's doing two, what, what's the issue here? So it, it does roll back into this whole idea of socio-technical people and process. Um, okay, so this is sort of a visualization of the process. Like I mentioned, it's a lot of organizing how much you wanna get to and then the process that's gonna bring you there. So this is idea of sorting it, straightening up, um, organizing yourself, shining, meaning it's the most efficient and best process standardizing it, so once it works, you wanna make it your policy or your, your typical routine, and then sustaining that. 
and even beyond sustaining, I feel like you could put in another one here that says um, it's continuous improvement. So just because you're sustaining it, there might be some other problem that comes up. So noticing that and talking about it. So here's a bit of the whiteboards. I'm not kidding when I said the New York office, we had whiteboards this whole size of this wall. Um, so we had, uh, this is specifically a volunteer whiteboard. So you can see here the green is the goal number of volunteers they wanted per day. The black is the actual number of volunteers that they had. And the red is when they were behind. And we're going to do this on a few different, in a few different scenarios. But again, it's this idea, we know how many homes we're going to start. So we want 10 volunteers on each of those homes. So we need 30 volunteers a day. Cool. That's the plan. Now let's oh, recruit for those volunteers. Let's get on the phone. And then the same applied to, uh, actually, this is the New York board. Um, but this is the client version of that. So we would name out the client, the last name only, and their address. Um, and then we have goal, um, actual, and notes. And you'll see on the next slide, and this is broken down by just like a calendar sort of uh, process. But so this, we would update this every day. I will say it's not always the easiest to get a construction person to come in and do something administrative every day. So just a heads up there. But um, <laughs> there's the idea of ganting. This is called a Gantt board. But ganting out um, with the blue, purple, what you're aiming for. So flooring, flooring, flooring taping, or maybe that's trim. I think T is trimming every day. So, okay, great, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we did it, we got the flooring done, except then for some reason it took two extra days to do flooring, and so there we're behind. And then down there now they're trying to catch up and do some mudding. So, I mean, we created our own little like abbreviation system, but the, the idea, well, oh no, they're not states, yeah. It's Florida, I don't know what T would be, but yeah. Tennessee. Ah, yeah. No, that's a good, and Maryland could have been there too. Yeah, no, good call. Thank you. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll, I'll say that specifically. But yeah, so it's the idea of construction and what um, phase of construction you should be in every single day. And then that's why I mentioned this idea of getting the construction manager or project manager to actually come in and update this and not just do it on the computer where it dies, it kind of dies on the computer. If you are in an office, if you have the ability to be in an office and everyone can see it, not that it's like shaming, but it helps for everybody to see why you're behind. And again, if you have this culture of continuous improvement and Kaizen and talking about it, it's, there's, it's not negative, it's just fact. So then how do we fix it? Um, so that, I think that's, that's a good example. And then this, again, it's, it's, these are just like examples of how we visualize the process. But this was, again, we would, put, we would literally write out the boxes of the number of homes we needed. Um, and then when they were in there, they had been approved for funding, they would go into that box, and so on and so forth. So each box here represented the number that we were aiming for. And we would move the little card, it was very satisfying, into the next bucket and know that we, we hit the goal for that, that box. In addition to the visual, which is the kind of person I am, I've also used Gantt and CPM Pert as project management tools mm. to see the interrelationship. Do you do any of that? in addition to your visual whiteboard effort? What was the, what was the program you mentioned? The Project management tools like critical path method, et cetera. Um, we use, there was a group, a company called Procore that we were using for a little bit. We use Xactimate, um, but I don't think they're process tools. I think those are more like construction estimating tools. Oh, okay. um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but maybe, I mean, if that would help the construction folks kind of keep everything up to date, I think we'd be very open to it. Um, so then really quickly here, reduction of MUDA waste. So I mentioned this before, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but there's so many different ways and places that you could be having waste happen. And so thinking about that and then figuring out little different solutions to each of these problems, I would not recommend doing all of them at once. That's why the worksheet is only one page. Pick one, start with one work your way through that. If you can get through that and you really like how you're now sustaining it, back to that sorting um, picture, try another one. But, you know, take one problem at a time and one, like, waste space, uh, wasteful area at a time. Transportation is a good one, too. I mean, driving back and forth to sites, maybe you can bundle everything or start work all in one area at the same time. 
So I, like I said, small improvements equals big difference. Um, there's no problem too small. You can solve it by coming together and, and thinking about uh, reducing muta. Um, okay, so then just quickly to kind of like, I think we're wrapping this up, but goal setting, status at a glance, that just means, again, your visualization. If you're not doing um, in-office work, if you're, if you're virtual, we're mostly virtual too, um, then you do have to just have it on the computer, which is fine. If you have, um, I mean, I hate to keep using Excel, everything is like Excel, Excel, but if you're able to do a nice Excel or Google Sheets spreadsheet that is really simple, just like color coordinated, this is what has to be done every day, it's fine that it's not a physical whiteboard in a big office, but it's the idea that everybody is checking in on it every, at least once a day. Um, and so there is, you know, you have to give a little bit. We're all kind of in this weird Zoom world still. Um, and then problem solving. So identifying the root cause. Like I mentioned, I didn't even get into like the five whys um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of other material with it, but getting to the core of a problem, solving it as a group and then bringing up the next one. Question, yes. Yes, um, I'll make a note of that. Do I have a pen? Yeah, and I can actually, I can include that in the when we send out the PDFs. You're seeing like a sample template for prob a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, with like the five Y's and all of that. Yep. Oop, that's a terrible sound. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can include that with the PDFs definitely. That's okay. I think when I find doing projects like this, the hardest part is always like the beginning. Like, <laughs> yeah. Start it off. Yeah. So I just want to share that just in case you have some pointers as you go through your presentation. So. Um, yeah, I remember the first day that Scott came to New York and we were all like, oh, what is this? He's going to be with us for two days, eight hours every day. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think again, like the culture part of it really helps. So we knew culturally like where we were shifting towards um, and what the goal of it was gonna be before he sat down with us and made us go through this on worksheets all day. Um, so that helped, but yeah, I mean, it's hard. I think the more you can create that support system within the team before you go through the analytical and technical part, it helps, but, and even just like, if you have a person who you think's not gonna be bought into it, have them bring their first problem. Like say this, okay, you're, you, know, may, you maybe can know already that they're gonna not be into it. Have them bring their, their first issue and start with that. I mean, why not? So I, I think there's some ways to kind of ease people into it. Yeah. Um, and so Yoga 10 means share. Um, that is the in-house foundation. That's why we named it Share. Um, and it's observing best practices, reflecting, and then sharing. And I'm gonna keep going because I feel like I'm behind here. Um, right, so starting where we are, building the roadmap, and then commitment to it long-term is super critical. Okay, and yeah, like I mentioned from the beginning, this is not the only way to do this. I hope that when you go back and work with your teams, um, you can talk to them about maybe one or two things that you thought were interesting today and see how you can apply it to your programs. But this is certainly just our way of doing it. Um, and we, we hope that it is helpful. So this is my contact. I'm gonna leave my contact information on the, on the little table also. So you can, and I'll, I'll be here all day. So you can, you can definitely find me.